We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4 as we take a look at testing the spirits today. Uh, the few things I want us to be prayerful about is our election, our churches, and our country as a whole. Um, so I'm going to read the first six verses, and then we're going to go into prayer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But why don't we bow our heads this morning as we are coming up on November 3rd here, and we just really need the wisdom of the Lord in all of these things. The scriptures tell us that, beloved, do not us believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, but this you know, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is God's word. Father, as we come before you this morning, not only do we ask that you open up our hearts and our minds to what it is you have for us today, I pray, Lord, for wisdom. Lord, as we come upon an election this year in our country, I pray, Father, that you would just give, a wis give us wisdom and you would give us insight and you would give us a settled peace regarding a lot of things. But most importantly, Lord, that we would always know and understand that no matter what happens in this world, it doesn't happen outside of your care and your sovereign goodness. And we leave that in you and in your hands. And we, we pray that we would just simply be obedient to what it is you are stirring our hearts to. That we would honor you as we come upon this Tuesday, Lord. That we would just seek your face and our hearts and what it is we are supposed to do. Lord, that this would not be a divisive thing, but that we would come together in unity somehow. Knowing that Christ is king and that you, Father, still rule this entire universe. We leave that in your care, Father. We pray for churches around this country and around this world that they may be faithful in the preaching of the gospel, in the proclaiming of the name of Jesus, and doing the things that we are all supposed to do as pastors, that when we open up the book, Lord, we would preach the book, not ourselves, but Christ crucified for your glory, Lord. I pray for that in every pulpit across this country and around this world. Father, that we would honor the name of Jesus in everything we do. We would make much of him. Father, and for our country, we are so divided and so bitter right now that all we can do is yell at one another and name call. It's like a giant fifth grade brawl in front of the whole world to see, but we are no different than the rest of the world. We are just in rebellion, Lord, and we struggle to find unity. I pray for peace that will only ultimately come when the Prince of Peace comes back when he does so on that great white horse. But Lord, I pray for unity, that we would as a country remember that we are blessed by you and we are blessed through you and that we are your instruments of peace as Christians in this country and in this world. I pray that if we do nothing else, Lord, that we would behave in a way that gives glory to you, that honors you, and that magnifies the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for your word this morning that the word would go out, that our hearts will be tender, and that we'll be open to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Just kind of taking a look at how to open up this morning as we're going to look at the next two weeks. We've got a couple of sermons that... Um, one is to test the spirits, the other is the guarantee of our assurance. And uh, this week we're doing the testing of the spirits thing. And one of, what we're going to be doing today that we're going to learn is that in testing them, it's a really divisive thing when you think it through. Because it's one that actually marks out the believer over and against the non-believer. All based on what we do with this person named Jesus. And we need to remember that all based on what we do with this person named Jesus. Most especially in relation to the incarnation, what we would know as the virgin birth. That we need to teach the truth of Christ in the gospel, especially coming from the pulpit. And how that looks, how that plays itself out is so important. And I was laying in bed at one o'clock this morning 
um, actually about quarter or two this morning, just wrestling through this, I woke up with this thought in my head that from the pulpit I talk too much about Jesus. That was the thought that was in my head. I found that to be a little bit foolish, but there it was nonetheless. I talk a little bit too much about Jesus. Um, and so I just was prayerful to the Lord that I would sort these things out because it unsettled me. And, and it dawned on me that my wife and I go to the Cape every year. And I will get to the actual message, but i got an extra minute or two here. Um, we go to the Cape every year because that's my place where I'd like to escape. And um, there's so many beautiful New England congregational Methodist churches that are down there that are huge, that are just these wonderful facades with the stained glass windows and all of that. And um, we go to every one of them. But we don't go to every one of them for a church service. We go to every single one of them because they have a thrift store in the basement. Because at some point along the way, the gospel itself stopped being proclaimed from the pulpit in those churches. And I would have that argument with anybody. But somewhere along the way, the truth of the gospel stopped being proclaimed in those churches. And ultimately, you have these beautiful buildings that sit three, four, and 500 people that have about 15 or 18 people each week. More people go through the thrift store on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday than they go and sit in the pews to hear the word preached because it is no longer preached. And that concerned me a great deal. So I sat down at my desk at the crack of dawn this morning and I wrote three things. Preach Christ and him crucified. Speak to your people. Minister the gospel to them. I have but one string on my banjo. So here's the tune. We've been about eight weeks now into the study of 1 John, and we are more than halfway through this beautiful little letter. And we began, as you remember, in a summary all the way back in chapter 1, where John was really helping his folks to know and to understand who this Jesus actually is and who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God in the flesh, not just a regular old guy. And John was an eyewitness to this. We have seen was the mantra that he had in chapter 1, wasn't it? That was his emphasis throughout. This is no fairy tale. I actually walked with him. I saw what this Jesus did. I was in that empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday. We learned that John at that time desired nothing more than all of Jesus' followers to walk in the light of the truth of that statement. And that in that, to confess our sins to him whenever it is we do something wrong, we are guaranteed forgiveness because of what Jesus did. And yet at the same time, we needed to remember that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. That we weren't to abuse that, and we can't be cheapening that if we abuse God's forgiveness to us by just continuing to do things wrong over and over and over again after we have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. No, he, he encourages us to walk in the light as he is in the light. A little bit of DC talk for us this morning for those of us old enough to remember that song. We're to honor the grace given to us freely by doing the right things in life. That's our faith and action, making sure that we are honoring Christ in that way. We then moved on to rote memorization. Do you remember? Bless the pastor out. Rote memorization. Do you remember? It's the best way for us to learn, actually, as John repeats himself over and over again. And he's reminding every single generation that we have work to do because of what it is Jesus has done for us in this world. You see, that grounds us in a way that brings protection against false teachers and who crop up among the church body throughout church history. That's why it is we need to constantly be telling us these things. It gives us concern about the ultimate antichrist we learn while we sort out that there are actually many antichrists who show themselves down through the ages of church history. It's another reason why it's good to understand church history and not think that we are the end-all be-all in 2020. Goodness gracious, if that's the case, we've got problems. We need to remember that the biggest indicator, and we're going to learn more about that today, the biggest indicator about false teachers and antichrists is their teaching on the person of Jesus. Just who is he? Why is it he actually came in this world? And how is it he entered into this world? And that's the eternal question that every human being who walks this planet actually has to ask. What do you do with this Jesus of Nazareth? What are we to do with him? 
Because John reinforces the truth for us of who Jesus is when he talked about the last days and Jesus' return. We covered that as well. Once again, emphasizing how it is we're to live in this world every single day. Our sanctification works itself out in that dynamic tension of the in-between. From when Jesus ascended all the way to his promised return on the last day, we are in the last days. People who panic, they're, oh my goodness, they're upon us suddenly because this person's in power or that person's in power or this, that, and the other thing. How wrong can we be? It has been the last day since Jesus ascended in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. That's the wrong question to ask. We are in the last of the last days, perhaps, but we need to focus on the fact that we are saved from sin's penalty because what Jesus has done. We will be saved from sin's presence when he ultimately returns, but we need to remember in the here and now that we have to fight the fight. We have to stay the course. We have to hold the line. Why? Because every single day that we are here, we are battling to be saved from sin's power. We are battling to put flesh to death. Put, therefore, to death that which belongs to the flesh, Paul tells us. Loving one another in a way that proves that we belong to him, John let us know last week leads us once again to this revisiting, as it were, and repeating of the watching out for false prophets and teachers. It's important that John gets this message across. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. John here gives us a really clear blueprint. For anybody who's a little confused on how it is we test this out, he gives us a real clear blueprint to start with. And again, it's that simple question, what do you do with Jesus? Told you I got one string on my banjo. What do you do with Jesus? We need to always be careful, most especially when we see passages like this in the middle of this. And this is my reminder to you, my reminder to you, my people. Never overcomplicate the simple. Never overcomplicate the simple. So many books are written on this stuff to bring so much confusion to a very straightforward and simple thing. Let's not do this. Let's not get ourselves to the point where we're asking so many qualifying questions that we lose ourselves down the rabbit hole of theological eggheadedness. We don't learn anything. We just impress ourselves with what it is we think we know. Don't don't go that way. It's very simple. Test the spirits. Test the spirits. Why? Swindoll puts it this way. He says, don't go by how large a crowd the teacher is able to attract. Not that that's a problem, but just hear what he has to say. Don't be impressed by titles, degrees, or letters after names. Don't be enamored by the beauty of the robe, the sheen of the suit, or the eloquence of the voice. Our standard is the word of God, the gospel of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the essential truths of the historic Christian faith. The essential truths of the historic Christian Christian faith. Stephen Whitmer puts it this way, that the vast majorities of sermons preached around the world on any given Sunday are preached by no-name pastors to no-name people who will never be heard again. But it's the gospel that's being preached. That's what we focus on. It's not all the bells and whistles that come along with it. You see, there's false prophets out there. There have been through the dawn of time. And the frightening thing about false prophets is, guess what? They're very hard to tell false prophets from Real prophets, that's what makes them so sneaky. They're those who are and who will continue to lie to you on a regular basis with the things that they say. How do we know that they're lying? It's a question we need to ask. How do we know they're lying? By how they treat, how they teach, and how they talk about Jesus Christ. That's the simple end all. Do they confess him as Lord? Do they believe that this book is the word of God? Do they believe that Jesus was actually virgin born? God in the flesh. That's what John's talking about here. Now remember chapter 2. The Bible always does what? It interprets the Bible, right? That's really the easiest thing. That doesn't mean you can't go look at other books. I would encourage you to do so. But the Bible always interprets the Bible. Chapter 2 of this very letter, John says, Who's the liar? But he that denies Jesus is the Christ. It's pretty clear. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the the Father or confesses the Son has the Father also. 
We talked about this midweek in our small group Bible study. I get here about 4.30 on Wednesday mornings. You can send me, I'm a crazy email letter if you want later, but I, I really, I'm encouraged by that group of guys. I am so encouraged by them. Something I didn't have for six years. Um, we gather together here at five o'clock and we pray for all kinds of things. And then we go into my office and we, we kind of tackle the things that we talk about here on Sunday morning. Uh, I would encourage you to be there or another small group that you're aware of. But we, we talked about this topic uh, a Wednesday a couple Sundays ago. How do we know these things? The reality is, is that you can't deny that Jesus is the Christ, that he came in the flesh and think that you have the Father who sent him. That was the question we wrestled with. How do we know that? Well, you see, the reality is, is this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each one of them are unique and of themselves, right? They are. This is why I think I'm over my head in this letter. A lot of doctrine going on here, but I'm working on it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are all unique and of themselves, but the Bible tells us they come as a package deal. You can't believe one and not the other two. You can't say one isn't real and think two are or all that, any way you want to pick it. So we can't approach this Jesus and say he was this wonderful moralist. Nowhere in the scriptures did Jesus of Nazareth give anybody that option. Nowhere. And that's John's focus here. Because that carries forward to a very unintended consequence. Follow with me here, if you will. That he didn't really rise from the dead either. Now how do I get there from saying if I don't believe that Jesus wasn't virgin born, that he didn't rise from the dead either? How how did I get there? Well, Well, follow me. The virgin birth itself allowed for the resurrection. See, if Jesus wasn't the Son of God, incarnate, God in the flesh, there's no way the resurrection could have happened because dead people don't raise themselves from the dead. It's got to be something unique and special about you. So the virgin birth allowed and points to the resurrection. Because the resurrection itself happened, that then becomes proof that Jesus actually was virgin born. One proves the other. You toss one out and say it's not true. The other one falls apart. You can't have one without the other. They are two pillars of our belief system of the Christian doctrine. The incarnation and the resurrection. In denying one, you actually falsify the other. And in the denying of these things, what John is saying is to deny that Jesus is even the Christ. And you can't do that. Because John is once again focused on the central message of the Bible. And that's the gospel. That God sent his son Jesus into this world to save humanity from their sins. See, he's given proof of that by raising him from the dead. And if you don't believe that, Don't profess to know the Father. You can't. It won't work. This is in direct contrast to the teachings of what John has. And it's a challenge, actually, to the Gnostic teachings that he was wrestling with on a regular basis. Because the Gnostic teachings went some way like this. That no God little g, would ever lower themselves to enter our world by becoming flesh and blood. No God would ever do that. Dirtying themselves with this world. See, there's a problem with that that John is saying here. God did just that in the person of Jesus. And that's John's message in his letter. Again, to deny one of these core beliefs is to absolutely deny the other. And John is drawing that clear line. He doesn't want his people to miss it. And we can't miss it either. Because the line in the sand's being drawn. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Well, can we study that for a little while and maybe open some books to see what that really means? I'll say it again. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And there's that Antichrist piece once again. See, John's dug down even deeper here to counter all the false teachings that he's wrestling with that have cropped up among the believers, not just in Ephesus, but all around. And he's doing so even more than he did in chapter 2. I mean, think about this. Listen, any of you who does not and who will not confess belief in Jesus, John's just really driving this point home, has the spirit of Antichrist in you. It's a good way to talk to your congregation, isn't it? Feeling a little grumpy today, you old fart? No, if you don't confess Jesus, you, just, you don't have the spirit in you. That's just the way it is. And I can hear John saying, no, 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 not really. That's not really the case. Time is short. Life is valuable. 
both here in this world in the here and now and in eternity. And I don't have time to mess around and waste around with mincing words about how it is. We need to recognize today that we have to balance love, that we have to balance compassion, and we have to balance truth. You gotta remember that. God is love. We have to balance love, compassion, truth. All three of those. We worry so much in this world about being offensive with everything that we say that before we even say it, when we talk to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, we're all apologetic because we might hurt their feelings. All the while, we are offending God by our vagueness about who this Jesus is and why he came into this world and why it is so absolutely essential that we know. We have no problem offending him, but we don't want to offend the person standing in front of us who doesn't know who Jesus is. And we need to be very careful to balance love, compassion, and truth. Truth is lost in the milieu of I'm going to offend somebody. Tact is not a quality my mother ever said I had, so if I've offended you, you could probably find my email somewhere. And I'm not talking, and I just want to clarify this because there's always somebody that will come up to me after. Please don't go start your own personal ministry of jerks for Jesus. So then you can then tell the Lord, I've a, you know, I don't really care how I treat people and how I offend people. Let's find the balance. Love, compassion, and truth. We cannot forsake the truth for fear of offense. But how we present it, we do so in a wonderful way and in a loving way and a compassionate way. Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church talks about the foolishness of the cross and the offense of preaching such exclusive truths in a world that doesn't like exclusive truths. Don't ever think that in our 21st century enlightened arrogance that we have created something new and some kind of offense in our cancel culture of today that is something nobody's ever seen. We dress it up a bit differently because we're, you know, just so much better than everybody else. But frankly, it's still the same spirit of the Antichrist who wants to deny who Jesus is. How I like to put it is it's the same pig with a brand new tuxedo and a little bit brighter lipstick. We need to be very careful. Here's Paul dealing 2,000 years ago with this issue about the cross and about who Jesus is. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now, if we need to have that a little clearer, I've pulled it out of Peterson's paraphrase here. I'm not sure it needs to be, but I really like how Peterson puts it because he's usually not too vague himself. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way to salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. It is written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head, I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots, winning a lot of people today so where can you find someone truly wise truly educated truly intelligent in this day and age hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God God in his wisdom took delight in what the world considered dumb preaching of all things to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation See, God has a message. It's a very clear message. It's a very pointed message. And it is, that, is, is focused completely on Jesus and the cross. And what John is saying here is to deny this is to deny God. Please don't do that. Now, I, for those of you who like music as myself, I, I purchased Bruce Springsteen's new album this past week. Um, I really like Bruce Springsteen. He's one of my favorite writers. Uh, my wife has a very different opinion on that, but that's okay too. Um, and I just started doing a little digging after I listened to one of his songs called, I don't even remember what it was. I think I, I, I Am the Priest or something. And I looked up what his faith stance was. And this is what he is quoted as saying. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. 
okay. I believe in his power to save. Even better. I believe in his power to love. Ooh, I'm, he's good. But I don't believe in his power to damn. And I know that's not a word we want to hear, but let's think that through for a minute. Because what has he done? He stopped short. He stopped short of that peace that deals with sin. And it's sad, really, because he's almost there. He's almost there. He's got almost all the truth. You see, we don't have the option to pick and choose what we like and what we're comfortable with with the Scriptures. Now, I don't want to be morbid. I don't want to be all those things. But let's be honest here this morning. If all of us are honest in our own quiet little selves, we tend to pick and choose what we're most comfortable with, most especially when our flesh is offended. I don't like what that says there, so it really can't mean what it says. But we have to face those things. And sadly for Bruce, he's got one more step he needs to make. He needs to face the fact that Jesus came for his sins to be forgiven. Not just all the good feeling stuff. And no matter how stupid people may think this is, and many do, it doesn't change the truth of God from eternity that he decided to save us in this way. He acted on our behalf by giving us his only son, both to save and, yes, ultimately to judge those who refuse his free offer of salvation. His own son, Jesus, would freely accept that assignment and he would be obedient to death, even death on the cross for you and for me. You see, that's Paul's statement in Philippians 2. It won't be on the screen because I added it after. But Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's the virgin birth. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's the resurrection. All right there in those two short verses. To deny this is antichrist. But you, but you, if you are in Christ, John says, you, my children, you are not them. You aren't them. He does the hard stuff first, and then he brings the encouraging piece here. No, you are overcomers. You are overcomers. That's what the Bible tells us. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now this echoes another promise of Jesus that we talked about last week. Remember in John's words of Jesus in the garden when he said, I have said these things to you that in me you will have peace. In this world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you know why you're an overcomer? Because you have Christ. If you have him, you have overcome the world. And Colin Cruz in his book on 1 John says, John recognizes that his readers have overcome all of these antichrists, not by their own unaided effort, but because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Believers are not only from God, as this verse indicates, Cruz says, but also indwelt by God. That's the promise that God has given you. And next week we're going to talk about the beautifulness of the assurance that you have if you are in Christ. You don't have to wander through this world wondering if you're really saved or not. You are overcomers because he has overcome. That's the beautiful thing of what John is saying here. He is in you now by his Holy Spirit. That's the promise of the scriptures. Nobody can talk that out of you. Your victory and your salvation is assured because of Christ. So no matter what you faced, Jesus has already overcome it. And I find great comfort in that. Because this year has been anything but normal. And yet at the same time, there has been a settled peace for us that has put us in a place that gives us a deep confidence that God has us right where we're supposed to be. And because of that, we overcome. So what are you struggling with today? What did you get out of bed this morning and your feet hit the floor and you were worried about this morning? What is it in your life that you are really having a hard time with? Why don't you lay it at the foot of the cross and ask the Father in heaven, help me here, write it down, pray about it, bring it to him, ask God in Christ to strengthen you through whatever it is you are struggling with and whatever it is you are dealing with. There is nothing that he cannot help you with. Sometimes that's through the people that are in your life. That's why my Wednesday morning group is such a great thing. You see, the victory is assured. Even though the world rejects that victory, it is guaranteed. 
This is this Jesus, this meek and mild, the sage and the moral teacher, the, the Jesus, the nice guy who just challenges us to love everyone all the time, no matter what, no matter who, no matter how, no matter what they're doing in this world. We just got, we got to love them no matter what. That's just fine with the world. And we are supposed to love. I'm not saying we aren't, so don't misunderstand that. But you see, that Jesus, that Jesus is an invention of the world. It is not the Jesus of the Bible because he ain't meek in any biblical sense of the word when you think this through. That Jesus is actually weak. W-E-A-K. Weak. This meek and mild waif who goes around with nice little sayings and all that stuff just wanting to love everybody. He's not offensive. He's accepting every single human being no matter what their heart says back to him. And he is useless absolutely useless by way of salvation absolutely useless you see the main problem with that jesus is that he's not the jesus of the bible I, we need to think these things through i had to wrestle this all week long I, this is john is just really concerned about his people you see the jesus of the bible john says here in verse 5 doesn't fit with what the world says because they are from the world Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Again, another very clear-cut statement in this letter, because they want Jesus, the moral teaching man. They want the guy with the good ideas. They don't want the Jesus who flips tables. Frankly, I'm not sure any of us want the Jesus who flips tables, who challenges us in our sin, who looks at me and says, you know, Michael, you ought not to be doing this. You ought not to be thinking this. You should be doing that instead. And you should be thinking this way instead. Who challenges the status quo that says if you want to love people, you will love them genuinely. Not just to get something or to make yourself feel good, but to genuinely love. And he challenges all of the kings and all of the kingdoms and the petty little potentates who think that they run this world right to the end, who abuse his image bearers and his world. He challenges them every single day they get up and choose to decide to do something that is in defiance of what Scripture says. Because of what he did, everybody who rules in this world will be accountable for everything they do. Everyone. Everyone. And that Jesus of the Bible tells us about, and he challenges us to die to ourselves and to live differently than the world, to challenge those in power who say that they are kings and that Jesus is not. We need to be careful. I pray that you would hear me. Don't shut me down here, but please listen to this. We have got to be careful of those who are in power who use humanity as pawns in a power game to keep themselves in power all the while using us in a twisted way in an effort to maintain control and keep that power. They will be accountable for those things. We must be accountable this way and then love this way and honor Christ in every single thing we do. Be careful, be careful of all of the kings and leaders in this world, not just here in this country. Look at the world, they all operate the same way. Sometimes they just simply use Jesus as a prop and a means to their own end. They're accountable right to the end. Let's remember John's words that when he appears, we will see Jesus as he is. And the Bible tells us this, that he will finish the work of making his creation whole. And he ain't coming on a donkey, all meek and mild. That's the first reading this morning as we come to an end here. John in his revelation tells us this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And this is the same John who wrote this letter. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on, a white, ho on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. 
He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. These are not things we like to hear. I'm not afraid, though, because I know in whom I have believed. And if you are in Christ, you have no fear either. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. John tells us in verse 6 here that we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Is that arrogant? Only if it's untrue. Otherwise, it's the settled confidence in the truth of what the Bible tells us about Jesus of Nazareth. Whoever knows God listens to these words, and we in turn do what he commands. Whoever doesn't know God thinks we're nuts. Thinks we're radical, thinks we're offensive. Now, I want to close with this, because yes, I'm actually going to be quiet now as we get ready to go into communion. The more negative the culture and the world views the church and the exclusive claims of Jesus, the more they will fight against and the more they will push back against that truth. And we can see that clearly today. Now, I want to encourage you with this. The settled truth is that if we are in Christ, we are kept. We are empowered. He loves us. His Holy Spirit is in us and he will sustain us in all of the adversity that we have. Listen to him. Read your Bible. Pray every day. That's why I get paid the big bucks to tell you that. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Be in community with God's people and get to work in this world. If you are in Christ, you have nothing to worry about. If you are in Christ... You have work to do. If you are in Christ, he ought to be stirring you to be on mission, which is the how can we share Jesus with this world? How can we let them know that he passionately loves them? Sometimes that's saying a hard truth that we need to give to somebody, but we do so in love, not with my jerks for Jesus t-shirt on. Why don't we just pause for a moment? think on these things and then we'll go into communion Father you told us that we should be praying for the nations and if we pray any smaller than that we're not praying big enough We are to pray globally. We are to act locally. The local church is the place where we are discipled, where we grow together in love and in unity and in the power of your Holy Spirit. It's also the place where we come in and gather in order to be sent out. And sometimes... The gospel of Jesus is preached simply in how well of a job we do where you set us down on a Monday. Sometimes the gospel is preached in a quiet conversation in the corner of a coffee shop where somebody just needs to talk for a few minutes. And one of your children has decided that I'm going to carve out 45 minutes of that day and just sit and talk with that person. It might be as simple as paying for groceries for somebody who doesn't have the money to pay for groceries. Or tending, Lord, to your, your business and your farm and your home, knowing deep down in your heart that it's a gift from you and that we need to care for every bit and piece. The gospel is seen in all of those things. Father, may we understand that there is no mixing of the, well, I like Jesus as a cool teacher, so I'm, I'm good to go before God the Father. And the truth of the Bible that says that no man comes to the Father except through me and me alone, which means we need to bow our knees before you and we need to give our lives to you. And we need to say, yes, Lord, 
And in doing that, you make us happy people. My life is more full and more complete in Christ now than it ever was before I came to you. There are more things that I am free to do with the joy and the smile on my face than I could ever imagine before I met you. Never let the lie of this world and the enemy say that we have to give things up in order to be happy. We need to give those things up that are not of you. And in that, we find deep happiness, Lord. Father, we are thankful that you gave your son freely. Jesus, we thank you that you gave yourself freely. Holy Spirit, for empowering us and infilling us and giving us the ability to understand your word. As we go into communion this morning, Father, prepare our hearts as we look to partake of the bread and the cup. May we lay before your feet anything that we need to that is in violation of who you are that separates us from you. May we confess it and may we give it to you in these moments of silence. And may your name be glorified in all of the things that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it and he handed it to his disciples. And he said to them, this is my body, which be broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this whenever you eat in memory of me. Then he took the cup and he said to his friends, he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood that will be shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, do this in memory of me. Again, Father, I say thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word, even though sometimes it's hard. Thank you that you love us enough to tell us that truth and that you have called us to be your own. As we step out of this place to take our kids home, to take our spouses home, to go about our day and the rest of our week, remind us, Lord, remind us, Lord, of how valuable you found us so that when we come in contact with somebody who doesn't know who you are, we know how valuable you found them and help us to be instruments of your peace and your love and your salvation in this world, Father, and all the things that we do. May we honor you for Jesus' sake. Amen. God bless you.